All right, Gods of War sit rep day 173. And I think it's safe to say that we're back to the no end in sight after the little ceasefire suddenly declared non-binding, which I didn't even know was a thing. Well, it's not a thing. I didn't know there was a thing that you (laughs) could... It's not a thing. (laughs) You could declare a a United Nations Security Council resolution non-binding after after it passes. But uh, anyway, it's clear that um, that's their way of letting Israel ignore the resolution. So... Weird that they would let it pass and then declare it. I I think, I mean, I don't know. I I still think, John, that these international institutions were actually of great value to the U.S. So it's it's very strange to see them undermining them at every turn. Like, UNRWA was good for the U.S. The U.N. Security Council was good for the U.S. It's It's very strange to see them decide that they don't they just don't need them anymore yeah um... i I can't believe what we're watching all all around all the institutions being uh dismantled the fact that the israelis are willing to dismantle their um you know their core uh settler tenant of protecting their people and just going to allow them to slowly starve um is yeah it's it's remarkable that they there, there doesn't appear to be any interest on their part in a ceasefire. Um, a lot and like I've a... said so many times, there could be an initial exchange that is just the civilians. And then, anyways. And well, that's exactly what Hamas said when the ceasefire resolution came out. They immediately praised it. They immediately said, we're ready anytime. And then now they had another round of scuttled and go i don't want to say failed i want to, they're basically being scuttled by the israelis and hamas just has to report again that they don't appear to be serious they don't appear to be serious about it um no. so the main theme that i wanted to talk about today was the west bank and but i should we should we might as well go over some of the news you i'm sure listeners viewers have caught the electronic intifada live stream you went over the operations in the past week focusing on gaza and al-shifa hospital and the fighting back that's happening which is incredible is there anything you want to say to sum that up um no i mean not that i didn't say this afternoon but just not to imply that all our guests are the same Mm -hmm. um yeah just what you just said the 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 resistance is so fierce around Shifa in such a way that uh, makes these hospital raids um, have a serious toll on the Israelis. And the two previous, this is the second time the Israelis have reinvaded Gaza, Gaza City in the north. And the first time was the Battle of Zaytun, where there was more than 95 field reports from resistance attacks. Um, And this Shifa raid, they're at 75 operations. The Israelis said yesterday that they had carried out 202 operations in the area of Shifa Hospital. So you have a a guerrilla group that we are told is degraded, carrying out roughly the same or comparable, at least, number of uh, operations in a condensed space. So we just don't see any signs I mean, we just see signs of failure to raid those hospitals in the way that they did. And then yesterday, uh, the press conference by Hagari, the IDF spokesperson, Didn't he went at in detail and at length about the heroism of bombing Amal Hospital, pushing all the patients and injured people out of the hospital, and then putting sand berms around the hospital so people can't go back because that hospital was already dismantled previously during the Khan Yunus raid Um, and Palestinians had got it back up and working again within you know a week of it being back up and working the Israelis have all of a sudden have this intelligence that they raid the hospital Um, but in none of these raids do they even pretend that there's a pretense of command centers underneath the hospital, which would, if 
was true, which was the first half of this war's justification, the fighters would seemingly go down into that tunnel system and fight. But there's nothing like that. They're just sacking the hospital. The vandalism at Shifa, um, yeah, they just lost their minds. And there's no military objective to these things. And not to put it back on their people again, but just if you were to come out after however many months in a... Uh, being held in in captivity and and you learned that that your army rather than negotiate um, for your release was sacking hospitals, which history will record uh, that le the the depth of that cowardice. Um, it's just uh, yeah, I I don't see how in any way this is good for their state. They're fighting in the streets all the time. And it looks like Netanyahu's play is what? To, to hope for Trump? Is that what's going on? They're just going to wait for months and months? They keep threatening an invasion of Rafa, but as we've said on this show a number of times, there's no indications of a Rafa invasion, and we will visibly see mm -hmm. those. We will see that troop buildup necessary to fight in Rafa, um, and we're not seeing any of it. All we're seeing is aerial bombardment that has destroyed already 30% of Rafa just through aerial bombardment. They're bombing tent camps. They bombed Mawasi tent camp, which is a strip of beach with no infrastructure where thousands of people are living in, in cloth tents, not even in proper tents. Um, and so it's just the brutality of that to have fragments of a bomb flying around a refugee camp where the most protection anybody has is cloth walls. It's just, they're not even pretending it's a military objective. Um, and they said that, they said in the press conference yesterday that they, they believe that this raid on Shifa um, is successful. In their minds, this is successful, and it's putting pressure on Hamas to release the captives. So their their straight-up logic is if we sack and destroy the healthcare system, um, that, that the, the Palestinians might surrender. Yeah. Uh, there's contradictory messaging, right? Their, their spokespeople on Twitter are saying things like, this could all be over if Hamas would surrender. And then you have Yuav Gallant or whoever else saying this has to go on until we destroy Hamas. Yeah. So they, I mean, it's just the assault on logic, the assault on facts, the assault on. I hospitals. mean, they've set up a real fork in the road because the Americans are really clearly on record saying that they do not support a Rafa operation. And Netanyahu is very on record saying we will lose the war if we don't go into Rafa. Um, not sure how those two reconcile each other. Uh, yeah, like the maybe the not we were, I saw somewhere in the media, Israeli media, I think the notion that the not vetoing the resolution was like the equivalent of a yellow card in soccer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and some kind of warning. And but the thought I had today was, okay, so you've given them a warning. When you do call it off, you're going to say it was your decision to call it off because you decided in your benevolence, the U.S. decided in its benevolence that it was, that, that was enough now. But it's like, by that time, everybody's going to wonder, why didn't you do it sooner? <laughs> like, why did you wait until... Why did you wait until you'd undermined the Security Council, the like thumbed your nose at the International Court of Justice, defunded UNRWA, proven that the only possibility for survival is armed resistance? I, I, I don't know. Dis did you see that footage clowns today? of every western politician oh, sorry yeah, yeah no they're that's exactly what they're doing they're just humiliating them and yeah. dismantling their international system which as you said was built for them it didn't yeah. benefit anyone else um but them did right, you well, see the footage that al jazeera released today of the uh, someone trying to civilians trying to go back to the north um and they get shot 
and then bulldoze. And Israel buries them with their bulldozers. Yeah. Um, will that get covered in the, I mean, we ask this all the time. Will that get covered here? Like Shifa wasn't front page news here. The news happened every day in Canada without that. Um, but these are the kind of things well, that... And then, and then there's some mayor who says, some Canadian mayor of some small town who's out there on Twitter saying, Israel has a right to defend itself. It's like, you're a Canadian mayor of a small city. and you're... Oh, yeah, I saw that. Was that in Quebec? Yeah, I don't know where it was. I don't even know. It's ridiculous. Um, so, okay, so let's do let's do our summary of the field reports. I have three days, I think, since it's been three days since my last sit rep. So the 25th was lots of Shifa. Sniper, sniper, Kassam reports sniping three soldiers in El Shifa, targeting a building housing special forces with a TBG. I think I covered all this, actually. I think I did talk about the 25th. Let's go to the 26th. 26th. This is all off of our usual guy, or Aria, A-R-Y-J-E-A-Y, who compiles these every day. Um, two Merkava tanks with tandem rockets. Was this a video? Causing one to completely burn in the Al Amal neighborhood west of Khan Yunus. So is that where Am Amal Hospital is? Are we starting to see a battle for Amal Hospital as well? Yeah, they defended, yeah. They defended that uh, invasion. Um, targeted... but we're not seeing anything. We we haven't yeah. seen video from Khan Yunus. Yunus is... The media department in Khan Yunus seems to be cut off, either mm -hmm. out of uh, yeah. an abundance of caution. Um, yeah. But we kind of pointed that out in a while back um, when yeah. we when they kind of went dark for a bit during the battle in Khan Yunus. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more difficult to tell now because there isn't as much fighting in Khan Yunus, but. Um, yeah, it, it appears that the media arm out of Khan Yunus isn't communicating in the same way as the North is, because in the North, we're getting stuff within hours. Yeah. Uh, Yassin 105 hits a, a Israeli military jeep in Tel Al Hawa and a sniper operation in Tel Al Hawa. So Rashid Street, west of Tel Al Hawa neighborhood in Gaza City. There's Where's Tel Al Hawa relative to Shifa? It's on the way to Shifa. So they're coming, basically they're um, they're operating through the Netzarim corridor um, that I did on the show last week where the Israelis are attempting to cut the Gaza Strip in half um, south of Gaza City. And then so that allows their armor to move down to the coastline without going through any built up area. And then they advance uh, up the coast from there. So this they have to go through Talahawa to get to um to get to shifa um, the jeep is interesting because they must feel at some point along that corridor that they're safe enough to be in a jeep um so that's After how big everything. that buffer zone is and they still they still get hit uh, oh yeah they had to have lost that they had to have lost mm -hmm. i mean they had to have 10 vehicles out of service based on yeah between the videos that we saw. And then there's shelling. You showed some shelling operations too. Uh, Al Suraya Al Quds says shelled positions of uh, Israeli soldiers with 60 millimeter regular mortar, sh mortar shells around Shifa. So that's a no major... indication of any of these weapons in any kind of shortage still. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that's most remarkable to us because to confess the things that we got wrong in this conflict, mm -hmm. I, I didn't I didn't see 150 days of ground war continuous, or I guess it wasn't continuous because we had the 10 day pause, but let's say it's been 120 days of ground war continuously. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't see that coming. I thought there would be- um, Exhaustion would... on both sides. Exhaustion on <laughs> and both a desire sides. to bring their people home that yeah. that um, that I thought was going to color these um, this battle. And it's clearly not. They're just ignoring them. And the the shelling. I mean, the sh I think the shelling is quite significant when you're talking about gatherings of troops that are getting ready to attack a hospital, because you have to stage that right. Shifa is a gigantic block city block sized complex. They're, they're applying the operational art of 
military organization to attacking a giant hospital complex. So they're setting up field headquarters and stationing themselves. And these are perfect for being mortared by... by I mean, it's not clear to me uh, in in terms of educated guesses. It does not clear to me that the Israelis intended a 10-day plus operation at Shifa Hospital. It looks like they ran into resistance. Yeah, um, I I think it's one of these situations where the Israelis are like, hey, we can get some of these resistance fighters and the resistance fighters are like, hey, we can get some of the Israelis. So I think there's, I think they're both trying to exploit the situation and that's what's turned it into a real battle. Yeah, I mean, the the, the Qassam brigades in that area of downtown Gaza City are presumably, that's presumably where they're the strongest. Yeah, um, and they want to fight, right? I mean, they want to fight, so... Yeah, they have to fight. I guess we talked about this once before, but they, I, they, they have to. They cannot allow these hospitals to just be. Um, yeah. But, well, uh, like, yeah, because I've they're being this... dismantled. Yeah. The I've goal said... isn't to go in and get a fighter and take no. a photo. It's to when you leave the hospital, the hospital doesn't work anymore. They, they, they also know, which nobody knew or could have guessed, the first time the whole point was to attack the hospital that's not a normal human thing that a normal human would ever think was going to happen but now that they've done it once you can plan around the israelis doing it again it's some kind of compulsion almost i mean yeah analyzing it in terms of military logic is difficult analyzing it in terms of like a serial killer returning to the scene of the crime Anyway, um, Alex, the Martyrs Brigades are fighting in Khan Yunus, Beit Hanun. I think you talked about how Beit Hanun is the northern entry point into Gaza. If you go into Gaza from uh, Erez checkpoint, you go via Beit Hanun. So they're still fighting in Beit Hanun. Yeah, the beginning of the ground war started in Beit Hanun. And then and it's the, six months on. The rocket five months the rocket attacks by hezbollah it's more than 10 on the 26th 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 12 on the 26th matula settlement shomer ashlomi avivim granite marin shaba farms hanita golan heights farshiba hills that's the 26th let's do the 27th 27th sniper a Qassam reports sniper attack on a soldier in Al Shifa vicinity shelling east of Al Buraj in central Gaza Strip Al Quds sorry Al Quds shelling around Al Shifa fired Badr one Iram rockets at a gathering of vehicles in a command center southeast of Kisufin. Oh, I didn't see that. That's a large payload rocket and that's a plural rockets hmm. al-aqsa martyrs brigades targeted Beit hafer settlement and sana sanuo's occupation bar- barrier with a heavy barrage of gunfire i'm not sure if that's in the west bank which we're going to talk about more shelling around shifa mujahideen brigades around shelling around al shifa and then hezbollah major major shelling of kiryat shimona again and headquarters with Brigade Six Seven Six Nine, and lots of other, lots of other attacks, interception of drones. Yeah, mortar attacks from the, uh, like from the army perspective, they always talk about mortar attacks that they're as, as like a real nuisance because the fragmentation, like pieces of metal that fly off of them, cover a wide area. Um, mm-hmm. And so, even if it's if it misses you, or if it's a small mortar um you know they don't treat it that way it's they have to set up their forces in such a way um to constantly be ready for that stuff and we're seeing some of the like the, the sarayal kuds attack that i showed today is you could see the israelis have really um shaped the landscape right they have really built in the buffer zone a, essentially a wall out of sand um, in the buffer zone where their troops are behind. And so we're seeing all those attacks hitting 
those troop positions. And that's the thing about this bisectional highway is that they're attempting, I don't know if you saw in the news today, but um, the Israeli state broadcaster reported on a warehouse that has started to be built there along that corridor, Nitzarim corridor, which will separate the north from the south and Palestinians will have to pass through um, this warehouse to get to the north. So like a massive checkpoint system. Um, they said it's two football fields wide. And it's just hard to imagine that you're going to have an Israeli installation there um, that's not subject to attack. Um, presumably, yeah. That it's, 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 it's going to be gonna a target. Be continuous, continuous attack. Yeah. So I think that gets me ready to talk oh there's yemen there was a there was an interesting speech by um malik houthi and it was a retrospective of the war on yemen Did yeah you, yeah you, so i think yesterday was the ninth anniversary of yeah. the um, so he gave these astounding numbers of the number of bombings the number of destruct the amount of destruction and you know like the the message the implicit messages and we're still here and the palestinians are still going to be there too yeah here i just found it here so they were hit by 274,302 bombs and missiles 613,992 homes destroyed half a million buried just very damaged destroyed 186 university facilities many completely destroyed 1800 mosques 427 hospitals destroyed and healthcare facilities including staff and patients killed 1331 schools and educational centers 146 sports and recreation facilities, 269 archaeological sites. Um, just unbelievable. 12,000 agricultural fields. Like it's really hard to even digest those numbers. 15 airports targeted, um, not just targeted, right? Like um, you couldn't get to Yemen for a long time. It's very difficult to fly into Yemen at all. 354 electrical power stations and generators, 7,940 7, roads destroyed. And and then and now here they are. They've and I'm built... not even halfway, so it's just <laughs> it's just unbelievable. And they've built a formidable military force and they're using it to try to stop it. A genocide so i mean and they did genocide by starvation against yemen too i mean yeah, we saw absolutely. there were pictures the kinds of pictures you're seeing in palestine of children especially starving to death horrific but it, what the, the one difference i can see is like you didn't see saudis or even americans and brits partying and and celebrating the starvation they tried to cover it up that's one amazing thing about the israelis is that story, the there. story of the Zionists down on the border blocking the aid is yeah. is dark. Yeah. I mean, that's I, I, that's an amazing. That's just amazing. I don't know. I don't well, know the International is. Crisis Group's Israel reporter said that 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 is the belief of most of Israeli society. Like, the yeah. people believe that there shouldn't be food until no. the captives come home. And then the Israeli media doesn't report on any of that doesn't really report on the starvation, doesn't really report on, on Palestinians at all. Listening Post did a, Al Jazeera Listening Post did a thing. I mean, the Al Jazeera Arabic shows Israeli television. They play long form excerpts from Israeli television. So um, this is knowable stuff. This is part of the reason why Nasrallah knows everything about Israeli media. Exactly. Um, um, okay, so I have a question. I asked, uh, I asked users, users, no, what do we call our friends, what, viewers? I asked viewers what they thought of this in the last sit rep, but you must have seen this apparent interception of a whole massive cache of weapons, supposedly from Iran. This is on Israeli media. 
So we have, you know, nine millimeter, I guess, pistols galore, rocket launchers, rocket propelled grenades, rocket propelled grenade launchers, mines, bigger mines. So th these are, are, is this real? Is this uh, painted styrofoam? Is this, is this, uh, are these replicas? What are we looking at here? And the next question is, if these are legit weapons that the Israelis intercepted, must there not have been other shipments that got through? You're muted, John. You muted yourself. Where was the interdiction point for that? The Israel seizes a large cache of Iranian weapons smuggled into West Bank. So I guess they're already in the West Bank. Arms include anti-tank missiles, RPG landmines, 50 handguns, 25 grenades. The activity was exposed and thwarted by the IDF and Shin Bet, who arrested Palestinian elements who were acting to carry out attacks. The Iranian elements responsible belong to the Special Operations Wing of the Intelligence Organization and the Re Revolutionary Guards and the Special Operations Unit of the Quds Force in Syria. So I guess they believe Syria to Jordan, Jordan to... West Bank? Yeah, there's been a couple interdictions through Jordan. It must be Jordan, yeah. But, that but looks I mean, like if this is the case, hall. this this is a big upgrade of weapons. That which... would have been, yeah, absolutely. No question. Yeah. Um, no, we're seeing, what we're seeing in the West Bank is, is um, ingenuity um, mm -hmm. to create these IEDs. The Israelis are talking about the IEDs all over the West Bank and how you know, they're 30 to 60 kilos, how they've encountered 150 kilo ones. Um, so these, these are, that's a big, that's a big explosion. That's a big explosion. So I want to show you a map. I want to show viewers a map of the West bank and the, whenever most of the reports that we see of big resistance operations are up in the north of the West Bank. Janine, yep. Nablus, Kalkilia, Tulkaram, Tubas. The Israelis used to call that the Triangle of Terror. The British did too, called it the Triangle of Terror. That 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 triangle, Nablus, Janine, Tulkaram has been yeah. uh, has been a hundred years of fighting. But also Tubas, yeah, over um over in the east. Um but so that's when there's been like Abdul Jawad said on our show today that I've been saying that there's an intifada in the West Bank. He said there's an intifada in the Northern West Bank, which I think yeah. is is probably a more accurate way to say it. However, um, there's armed struggle throughout the West Bank. There's armed struggle Absolutely. in Halil, Hebron. There's armed struggle in Dehesha camp uh, multiple times a week in Bethlehem. Um, we've seen attacks around Jerusalem in the settlements around Jerusalem, Ramallah. We've seen armed struggle. Of course, uh, Mujahid Mansur was fighting in the hills around um, Ramallah. There, um, there was an invasion into Jericho, um, which is not normally um, a, 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 not normally considered a hotbed. So, yeah, the yeah, the shape of the of the armed struggle in the West Bank is continuing to increase and is not bound by the same rules um, of as the Hezbollah fight and the um, fight. and the Gaza like negotiations. The diplomatic out isn't yeah. going to. There's not going to be something offered to the West Bank resistance. I mean, other than their prisoners coming home, which is significant. So just another couple of notes about the West Bank, because this map also shows uh, the fact that the West Bank is much bigger than Gaza. It shows all, but it does not show the wall and it does not show the way that these municipalities are divided from one another by Israeli settlements and also by Israeli settlement roads and by checkpoints and by bases and by the wall. So all of that is makes everything incredibly difficult, every aspect of life incredibly difficult for everybody in the West Bank. 
but it also is labor intensive for the occupation, especially as they lose control of the Palestinian Authority, which is another thing where there's a war of communications between Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades in particular, which is the fighting arm of Fatah, and they're fighting with Fatah, and they're they're publicly communicating that they're very upset with the leaders, and they want to... I saw a, a kind of a conciliatory one yesterday. I don't know if you saw it, but it was like, we're not going to allow the enemy to divide us, and we're not going to turn our guns on each other, but we want you to cut it out and stop working for them. That's so interesting because that the, the so that statement was when Abbas's inner circle said that Hamas brought the Nakba on. Mm -hmm. And then, so then that's the Palestinian Authority. Um, but Fatah, the Fatah Central Committee actually spoke out against that. So the, the leadership of the Fatah movement, which hasn't been speaking out against lots of collaborator things that you would have hoped they would have sp spoken out against over the years, um, but they did speak out over this one. And people reacted very strongly. The resistance factions throughout the West Bank reacted very strongly um, about that. And of course, there was um, an assassination in Janine the other day, and then the execution of the collaborators. I guess we talked about uh, that briefly. Um, but there's IEDs, improvised explosive devices, in Janine and Nablus. I'm seeing reports like this almost every day now. Every day. And there's large scale invasions every day into into these areas, constant. Um, but also the Israeli drawdown is the same in the West Bank. They sent their reserves home from the West Bank as well. So they're not um they they're not in a position for the for the West Bank to to explode. And I think yeah, like you said, there's no wall shown on that. Um, the wall plays a really significant role in um, cutting up the territory in such a way that would make, it makes it difficult for everyone. I mean, it's impossible. Like people from Janine, um, you, you don't call a regional demonstration, like a, a central location demonstration. And then people come from all over the West Bank to that demonstration. Like that kind of uh, social organization has been, dismantled by the Israelis going back to the 1990s, really, by the way that they carved up with checkpoints. Um, they just made it impossible for you to to travel. And even, you know, like when I was living in Janine and and I would go to any other uh, place in the West Bank and, you know, say, oh, uh, I've been in Janine. And people say like, oh, I haven't been in Janine in 20 years or, you know, and in this relatively small place um, because it's just almost impossible to travel. I want to say, though, I want to repeat that maintaining that situation is expensive and labor intensive, and it's manageable if that's all you're doing as the Israeli military. Now that you're also fighting a war in Gaza and Lebanon, it's a different story. And, and so... I, I also don't know how this is going to play out because I've seen resistance factions say things like that, right? They said the West Bank is key. The West Bank is the shield or something. They, they had this, this whole analysis of the West Bank's importance in the overall struggle. And so keeping all these people separate, keeping all these communities separate from each other, that's not, you don't just build a wall and then go home. You have to be, you have to staff that wall. You have to raid into these communities from that wall. You have to be blown up by improvised explosive devices and come under fire. Your checkpoints come under fire. So Yeah, and you have to ban people from crossing the checkpoints. And by doing so, you cut your labor force by about 100,000 people who worked in Israel from the West Bank. And Israel can't replace those people. If more than 50% of their construction projects um, are, are completely shut down since October 7th, and there's no sign of them starting back up. Um, they need to restaff hundreds of thousands of people just to get their economy. Um, and in these kind of stories, they don't get, The Economist sneaks it in every once in a while in a couple of paragraphs or in a podcast. 
Um, but the state of the Israeli economy to fight a battle, a war of attrition is, is not, um, it's not a positive thing for their state. Um, things aren't functioning. You know, the I whole reported. North's not functioning. The South's not functioning. In the last sit rep, I saw I had seen something on Al Mayadeen where they were citing Israeli sources saying the wage bill for the reservists is about a billion dollars a month, which is already. I mean, the is the American aid packages are in the billions per year, so it's yeah, all... they have to re re restock all of this weaponry. Uh, the other... They're already talking about being short on one five five millimeter shells. Well, they've got to split those with Ukraine, right? So that's a that's an issue. Israel can get priority, but there's only so many shells. Then, and, and the other thing we have to say today is, uh, you see the River Jordan, and on the other side mm. of the West Bank is Jordan. Very interesting. And Jordan, and the chants. They're not chanting for a ceasefire. No, they're saying, <laughs> they're saying you have them. You should pull them up and show people if they haven't seen them. the The chants were very of, strong chants. We are of, all we are all Hamas. We are all, all of Jordan is with you, Hamas. Yeah. Oh, Abu Obeda, we have answered your call. Yeah, don't talk about and then chanting to the security forces. Don't talk about peace and security when you're an American ally. That's dangerous stuff in a in a you know majority fascist dictatorship uh monarchy but yeah we're more than half your population is palestinians the <laughs> the chant today i guess is open the border open the border i don't know if we can hear that yeah because jordan's involved in these airdrops that brutal airdrop yesterday that killed that 12 people drowned going out to sea to get these airdrops just like uh, it's very upsetting very enraging and from amman to janine an uprising against the settlers that's another slogan uh, yeah this I, is this jordan stuff is very very interesting something I, to for sure watch if, if i put the sound on can you hear it john no no okay it's probably another setting yeah, incredible, incredible. Uh, these are the things that I what I always assumed would happen. I assumed there would be some destabilization, destabilizing effect of on Jordan and on Egypt. Egypt, Egypt always seems to be able to hold that down, but as always, it's. It's all held down until it's not, right? The stability of the Egyptian regime is remarkable. Yeah, um, I mean, the Jordanians are essentially an offshore base for the Americans, so it'll be interesting to see how the Americans handle um, those kind of demonstrations. So here's some other ones from tonight. Abu Khaled, we hear, heeded your call. All of Jordan is with you. Israel must be removed. Israel must collapse. That is what Sinwar taught us. <laughs> the masses want Al Qassam brigades. So yeah, and so Qassam, Qassam released an excerpt of Muhammad Al Daif um, from October seventh that fed right into the Jordan um, narrative, which is just another just like the media department so sharp. They're to, uh, they're involved. They're aware of everything that's happening and i think that that solidarity stuff is um you know like the the, the ability for sarayal kuds in gaza to immediately respond to the assassination in janine and salute their fighters mm -hmm. um those those kind of developments just clearly show um because that's the same thing as command and control yeah. The ability to have your fighters communicate like that, have information all the time, is the same network system, the yeah. same functions as command and control. So Absolutely. we don't see any indications of, of any kind of wearing down um, on the resistance. So there's one last thing I wanted to show, because I saw Vijay Prashad on Ranya Kalik's show 
And Vijay Prashad was talking about a report that they wrote at Tricontinental, which is this research institution called Hyper Imperialism, a Dangerous Decadent New Stage. And he showed, uh, he had a, they made an interesting calculation. They made an interesting calculation, which is this. They said actual world military spending is, there's the U.S. military compared to everyone else. But when you take it as a block, the U.S., the rest of NATO and the non-NATO U.S. block, it's like 74% of all military spending in the world. And China is the second most with 10%. Russia is 3%, India is 3%, and the whole rest of the global south is 10%. So in, in that rest of the global south, with all the other countries, with all the other countries that are helping, right? All the other countries that are helping the genocide, whether it's Saudi Arabia or Jordan or Turkey, all of these fairly big militaries that spend a lot of money you have also the whole axis of resistance is in that little yellow wedge yemen iran hezbollah syria they're all in that little yellow they're all par a part of that fraction so vijay was vijay was actually addressed our remember when we talked about how china or russia or somebody needs to run that blockade they yeah. need to go and check vijay, vijay was explicit about that he said they're not ready to do that yet they're not ready to, you know he's he said they're that day may be coming we don't know when but they're not ready to do that yet because that means a confrontation between the chinese navy and the american navy in the that middle was his East. supposition that they would literally yeah. just sink them yeah that was his supposition. He said, you know, they don't have, he was, he, he said something. What I remember him saying was like, they have the, they have a growing confidence to challenge the rhetoric, but they don't have the confidence yet to make that kind of challenge. And I, I don't think I understood the size of the disparity in military. <laughs> The pie graph put you over the top. The pie graph is that's really something. <laughs> and I mean, we know that the US gets the least bang for the buck. So this is what some of the Russian analysts have said. It's like, okay, yeah, we spend a, a fraction, but right. every every you you but you have a thousand dollar toilet seats and everything else is super inflated. Yeah, they're spending so, their money on tanks and armaments. Yeah. So, but even, even then, even then the disparity is, is immense. So this is why, you know, this is why you hear Nasrallah and, and people like that in the axis of resistance saying things like at calling for, for patience. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that is fair to, 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 to I think we all want Hezbollah to do more, um, but there's the, you don't just jump into World War Three, and yeah. Lebanon is a, a very uh, what? What's the opposite of resilient right now? Yeah. You know, their economy is completely eliminated. Um, their state apparatuses are non-functioning. Um, it's just it's 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 a difficult thing to say. Yeah. Let's sign up for World War Three. And their whole. Their whole point is Israel would be destroyed too. Yeah. But there's no way that they can stop Israel from destroying Lebanon. It's that's how deterrence deterrence is deterrence is not we have a big shield we can throw up and stop you from destroying your country. The deterrence is mutually assured destruction. Deterrence is if you you can't destroy us without destroying yourself, which is also what I thought was the case for gaza i i thought israel i didn't think israel could do this without destroying itself and i still don't i think that's what's happening it's just yeah such a horrific way i think israel has eliminated that middle category of people who reflexively supported Israel because they believed that they go to Starbucks and look like us or whatever, you know, the, no, they don't, they've lost that. They've only now have people who are in one camp 
or the other. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I saw some pro-Israel Instagram person who was like, it would be, it would suck. They looked at the rape reports of the, at Shifa Hospital, the reports that Israeli soldiers are raping Palestinian women at this Al Shifa Hospital, and and someone said, well, I don't know if it's true, but if it's true, this this stuff happens in war. And it's like, this was the justification for the yeah. genocide. This is, this was the whole, this was everything that you did, you've justified based on these lies about this happening on October 7th. And now you're saying it's no big deal. So. Yeah, they jumped on that story. Al Jazeera Arabic retracted that, um, that segment. Um, by the woman's testimony. Well, I imagine, I imagine they would be very scared of publishing that. It wouldn't, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that we saw those reports and it doesn't surprise me that it was retracted by Al Jazeera, yeah. especially. They can be made, I mean, they didn't even air the lobby documentaries, right? They made them, they investigated them, and then they didn't post them. Yep. They posted my Keith Dayton story when I broke the Keith Dayton story about training forces and torture uh, and they published it and then <laughs> unpublished it in like two minutes, I guess, the legal department and they held it for like three months. They did the same thing with the October 7th documentary for whatever reason. It's gone held... again? No, it's it w was supposed to premiere a couple weeks ago and then the day before it was going to premiere. They showed a segment of it. They showed the helicopter footage yeah. um, on the news the day before. And then all of a sudden it was like, hold up, hold up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of, but I believe it was, screws. it was broadcast in its full. There's a lot of screws that can be turned on Al Jazeera. That's for sure. It's a Qatar government. The U S has a massive base in Qatar. Though. Yeah. So I haven't seen that. You, I assume you've seen it. The October 7th. Yeah, yeah, Anything yeah. You should see it, we... and we should talk about it. But it it was I I I mean it's it it's an incredible day, right? Like the morning from six from six a.m. to nine thirty eight thirty a.m. is just an incredible military operation, and they had footage, um, all the footage that we've seen. I didn't they didn't have anything. I mean, this worldwide psyop against us is it, it. Even though we say we're impenetrable, it still impacts us, and it's still like, I when I first watched it, I was like, "Am am I going to see a video that I haven't seen? Did they uncover something that I? Is there some? And there just isn't. There isn't some secret do set of videos. This Israeli." videos that they showed in Hollywood or whatever, they're not different than any of the other videos that we've seen. Well, so yeah. this was all knowable stuff. It was knowable if you took the time to... It, uh, I watched, I think, on Electronic it. Intifada channel, just they, I think the portion of Al Jazeera that talks to that Zaka dude, and yeah. he's he's showing the interviewer his phone, and the interviewer is like, okay, but but that doesn't... That thing yeah, you he just sticks showed with me. the beheaded baby story, yeah. and then they say he's the guy. The guy says, "Show me," yeah. and he gets all nervous, and and he, he shows him something, and the guy's like, "That's I'm sorry, but that doesn't." <laughs> it's an adult. <laughs> I hate to say, what did he say? I hate to sound macabre, but that's not a child. That's not a child. Yeah. yeah, but that's what they want. Like that's that's like. A metaphor for everything that they're doing to us like there's something right in front of you that you can see and they're trying to tell you that it's something else okay give me give me half a second to find this uh testimony from that this was yesterday during the horrors that we're seeing at shifa they gave a press conference yesterday where they okay. used the word this was the idf's official statement not not a single civilian patient doctor or medical staff member was harmed in this operation only terrorists not a single civilian and we're watching hours long footage of horrors all around the hospital burning houses field executions 
shooting people on site in their house um, and people being stripped and told to walk away from the hospital. We saw footage of, I don't, I don't know what it's called, but you know, like when you have a broken, a shattered leg and you're attached to the hospital bed with that contraption, mm -hmm. the guy is walking out of the hospital holding that contraption still attached to himself, like some kind of thing that you couldn't like, I don't even think if you put it in a movie about, you know, like a Frankenstein situation that you would even think that someone could get up from that bed and walk out. And then the footage today from inside Shifa is that they just, they went around and smashed things. They just smashed the medicine cabinets, dumped the offices. Um, mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. That Al Jazeera footage made, made me enraged. And we know we talked about the Al Jazeera footage of the drone strikes on those in, clearly innocent civilians yeah. in Khan Yunis. Um, just for listeners, the Israelis published on that day in February the drone strike footage of them killing those five, um, four or five um, civilians. They just showed it from a higher drone with a lower resolution and it was thermal camera. So it was just black and white. And it it's like they're snuff films. It just explodes the whole screen. You can't tell any detail. Um, but they openly said that these were Hamas operatives. Um, sure. Yeah. And just... they have a ready audience. Okay. Well, pretty clear this is going to go on for a while. Sure and, seems like uh, it. We'll be here. So you you think I should watch the Al Jazeera October 7th and we should come back and talk just about that? I mean, yeah, I mean, it would be in Okay. I think. Let us know in the comments if you think that's a good idea. <laughs> should, that's, should we... bait. that's bait if there ever was bait. Should we do a Siskel and Ebert? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. No, it's just, it's interesting because nobody else in the world would do a documentary like that. So it right. is, I think, a unique... Yeah. Um, Unique, yeah. and they spent a lot of time on it. Um, okay, we'll but, do it. You know, we. I just want to say, like, there's nothing in that documentary that we didn't already report to you. We yeah. there's nothing in the documentary that we have gotten wrong, um, or even you know not as accurate as it could have been. Um, so, so yeah, and we're not like you just said we don't have any special access to sources everything that we used was right out there including the economist and the new york times and the Haaretz. everything that we used was right out there and and uh anybody could have done it and nobody did it yeah the, the one Wanda thing the Weiss documentary and gray zone and ei and us like the documentary definitely makes distinctions between the initial operation and the kind of uh, riffraff or whatever you want to say after the the looting kind of dynamic that happened after. Um, and yeah, it's there, there needs to be an investigation and, and Al Jazeera didn't do an investigation. They didn't get into those communities. They weren't able to, you know, the only people that are in, allowed into that closed military zone right now are people blocking aid shipments. Yeah. Everybody else isn't allowed in for an investigation to see what happened. But it, what, in, I mean, who has credibility to do an investigation at this point? I won't trust anything that the Israelis say about anything ever again. Uh, the Americans, the any Western country, the United Nations at this point. Well, the Israelis didn't let the United Nations person yeah. who was actually believed to be on their side writing that report. Right. They right. didn't let her go into the um, into those areas either. They didn't have to. Suppose. All right. Um, we'll stop there. Like and subscribe. Um, we'll see you next video. We'll be here. We'll be back. You can have no doubt of that. Good to see you, Justin. Thanks.